Hello and welcome to this video on material for Math 1431. This is Calculus 1 at U of H for the spring 2020. And <coughs> excuse me. And uh, this material is on the definite integral, which is section 6.1. So before jumping right into some of the material the department would like me to go over with you guys, uh, let me offer sort of my summary view of what this is all about. And so. Um, it turns out the what we call the definite integral is a continuation of one of the main story threads that ties together all of what we call calculus. So you can think of calculus is all about the following idea, and that is that curvy things are difficult but straight lines are easy. And you can really see that, um, you know, in our notion of taking a derivative and thinking of it as a tangent line. So when I talk about the derivative of a graph, I'm really talking about the slope of this tangent line, and I can use that tangent line to approximate the function. Right? We've seen this um, going under the name, uh, or going under two different names. One was the linear approximation, or the tangent line approximation, and then most recently, um, in chapter five, we saw this under the name of using differentials to estimate values of a function. Right? So um, this is one sense in which this idea of, of using limits to think really hard about how to replace curvy information with straight information makes a big appearance. And now we sort of shift gears and we can think about one other way in which this happens, not just with curves and lines, but with areas. Right, so it turns out that curvy areas can be hard to think about that is, it's difficult to express a formula for the area of a curvy object, but areas of straight things, areas of rectangles, for example, maybe rectangles and triangles and trapezoids, are easy. And so one way we sort of start to think about this is, again, we think about functions, and functions give us a way of thinking about maybe curvy area. So I might have a function like y equals f of x. And what I might want to do here is try to understand the curvy area under this curvy function. So I might want to try and compute the area of that red region I just shaded. And the idea is to say, well, that seems kind of difficult let's break this red blobby region up into a bunch of small green rectangles. And I can instead compute the area of these easier things, these rectangles. So rather than all that red area, I might try to compute all this green rectangle area. And sure, you can see in the picture I've I'm shading in right now, that this won't be the exact area, but it'll be a good approximation. And so that's what uh, this section starts to focus on, is this idea of, of uh, curvy information, curvy area, being approximated by easier to compute rectangle area. And so just to give you some notation, the actual area under that curve, let's say from the point I started A to the point I finished B, is going to be notated with this weird symbol. It's called an integral symbol or a definite integral symbol. And the way we're going to compute this actual area, right, we're going to compute this to be a limit of rectangle area. So, right, so if you look at my picture above, 
the rectangles, if I were to make more green rectangles, they would get thinner, and the gaps between my rectangles and the blue curve would get smaller, so the approximated area would get more accurate. So I just wanted to point out that we are indeed, just for the last three sections of this course, shifting gears, and we are, no, we are talking, switching from talking about derivatives to this new, actually this older question that predates calculus of trying to figure out area formulas for curvy shapes. But even though this is a sort of shift in focus, we're focusing not on derivatives anymore, we're shifting to areas, it turns out the story behind it, right, computing this area by approximating with straight rectangular stuff, this fits in to the broader idea of what calculus is all about. And then let me spoil one huge thing. Um, I'll, I'll insert another page here. So there's one huge spoiler coming up in a later section. So I'll, I'll just sort of briefly mention it. Um, so there's a big spoiler which says these two processes, computing derivatives, right? So taking a function and looking at the slope of its tangent line at a point, so looking at f prime somewhere, and computing areas, so somehow adding up information about your function, Right? These two processes are deeply related. These two processes undo each other. And this fact is what we call the fundamental theorem of this entire course of calculus. So on the one hand, we should think of these two processes as related in the way I just posed before. They both involve approximating curvy questions with straight solutions, but it turns out they're connected in this deeper way. If you want to go and compute a derivative, you've somehow, it's like you've undone the process of computing an area. That's what the fundamental theorem of calculus says. And that's more or less where this course ends. I believe this is from section 6.2. So section 6.1, what I'm going to talk about in this video, is just all about the process of defining um, this actual area, the integral from a to b of f of x dx, and computing it using rectangles. That's what 6.1 is all about. And I think I'm going to have to break this up into two parts. Um, so part one will really focus on, um, focus on this, but part two of these notes will focus on um, some properties of this quote-unquote definite integral of this area. And 6.2 is where we introduce, I believe it's 6.2, where we introduce the fundamental theorem of calculus, and that will give us a different way of computing this definite integral. Okay, so all of that is just sort of in the way of, a, of an introduction. Um, and just to get this started, let's do a little popper question. So popper question one. This one's gonna be gonna be pretty easy. Um, I'm gonna draw you a picture. All right, and if you hear those that sort of squealing in the background, I don't know if you can, but that is my wife and kiddo playing Luigi's Mansion. They're very excited. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do for this popper question. This is y equals f of x. And now I'm going to go, I'm going to select two points. Let's say this is the point 1, and this is the point x equals 2. 
And so here's what I want to do. I'm going to make a rectangle. And I'm going to indicate which rectangle I'm going to make. I'm going to make it in green. Even shade in some of its area. So there's the rectangle I'm talking about. And now I finally got to ask my popper question about this. What is a formula for the area of this green shaded rectangle? Is it A, 1 times f of 1? Is it B, 2 times f of 1? Is it C, 1 times f of 2? Is it D, 1 times f of 2 minus f of 1? Or is it E, none of the above? Now this might seem like a weird question, but what I want to point out is that a formula for the area of a rectangle, this should always be width times height. So, hopefully the answer is kind of obvious to you. If not, please feel free to take a pause and think this over. Right? You just want to look at that green shaded rectangle and say, okay, Based on the picture I'm given, do I have a number or a formula for its width, and do I have a number or formula for its height? You take those two things and you multiply them. Okay, so let's get down to what the definite integral means. And I, you can read these, these notes are here for you to read, but I would like to focus on... Um, there's a lot of stuff to read, so we'll go back through some of this, but let's focus on example one. All right, so I skipped a lot of stuff that really we should read, but um, I think by working out this example, we'll go through what, what those notes are really saying. So here's what's going on in this picture. They're giving us a function. It's part of the graph for y equals 1 over x. And here's what they want to do. They want to approximate the area under this graph so by under the graph, we mean beneath the graph and lying above the x-axis. So maybe I can shade the actual area in blue. Right? So that's what they want. They want this blue area. But we don't have a way yet of computing the actual blue area. So what we're going to do is approximate this area with rectangles. So this instruction here says, use left endpoints from 1 to 2 with n equals 4. Here's what they're really saying here. Approximate the actual area um, under 1 over x. Um, from 1 to 2, so I'll say x between 1 and 2, using uh, four rectangles. And not only that, they also told us, don't just use four rectangles, they mentioned this left endpoint thing. Left endpoints, what does that mean? Whenever they start talking about the endpoints of the rectangles you want to use, what they're really telling you is using um, the left endpoints for the height. So, had they said use right endpoints, that would be telling us information about making these rectangles a different height. Okay, so our goal is to approximate the actual blue area under this curve. 
and the rest of these instructions are telling us how uh, what sorts of rectangles to use so I'm gonna go along here I might have to insert some some additional room here but I'm gonna try to copy a little bit this so we're going from x equals 1 up to x equals 2 and so the first thing we're gonna do when they tell us n they said use n equals 4 we are to understand that that means four rectangles and so this is what you first do this is sort of step one you chop up your interval whatever your interval is into in this case n which is four equal pieces so this is the first step of setting up a rectangle approximation so <laughs> sorry so um, how are we going to do this in this case? Well, you can probably see how this is going to work. I'll try and use purple for this part. I might split this interval in half and then split the pieces in half again. And there I see my four chops. All right. So I just want to take this, this example a little bit slower um, to introduce you guys to the notation that we end up setting up to control all of this. Okay, so the width of one chop right we're chopping up the x-axis so we call that a little difference in x we use a triangle there it's sometimes pronounced delta the width of one chop is delta x so over in this picture this i would call delta x right those are going to be the widths of the four rectangles i use and to make our lives a little easier, we're going to agree, whatever your x interval is, in this case it starts at 1 and ends at 2, whatever it is, we're going to make those widths the same. We're going to take the interval from 1 to 2 and chop it up into four equal pieces. Each piece has width delta x. So there's always a formula for this. The width of your rectangles, the width of these chops, is always the length of your x interval divided by the number of rectangles you're using. So in this case, the width of each chop would be 2 minus 1 divided by, I need to make four rectangles. So each rectangle will have width 1 fourth. All right, here's where I need to insert another, another page to keep this example going. Okay. Okay, so that's sort of step one. This was what you always do. No matter what function you're given, no matter what interval you're given, you say, okay, I'm going to chop that interval into equal pieces, to n equal pieces, and I need to make each piece the same width which I call delta x. Now, we need to make the rectangle heights as part of step two. Really, step one, that delta x talk, is all about making widths. Okay, so if I look at my little graph above, I could make a rectangle height. Maybe I'll make these in green. I could make a rectangle height here, for my first rectangle, right? And if you think about that rectangle, that's sort of like our first popper question. The height of this rectangle, the height of this rectangle is really a y value of the function. If you think about it, that height has height f of one. But that's not the only rectangle I could make there, right? I could, instead of using the height at 1, I could plug in f of 2 and get this height. And now my height here would be whatever the y value is when I plug in 2. And you see, now I'll sort of draw both of them. Maybe I'll draw the first one in like light purple. So 
I have two different rectangles here, right? One of them has like this pinkish purple area. Yeah, that's not going to look good when I shade it in green, sorry. Um, one of them has this green area. That's if I use a height f of 2. I could maybe use that rectangle. The other one is going to have this purplish area. It's going to be taller. So which rectangle should I use? Should I use the height for the left endpoint, that purple point, or the height for the green endpoint, that right endpoint? Um, and you, it turns out, in setting up these rectangle areas, you get to choose how you want to do this. In fact, you could use the left endpoint for that first delta x chop, and then your next rectangle could use a totally different height. And what happens is it doesn't matter once you take a limit as your rectangles get larger in size. They get larger in number, I should say. So typically what we end up telling calc students to do is we say, okay, okay, we want you, right? I'm going back to the start of the problem where I highlighted the left endpoints. We want you, oops, sorry, we want you to always use the same endpoints to make the same type of heights. So in my picture down here, when they said use left endpoints, what they were really saying, right, was always use, um, always use what I'm gonna now refer to as the purple area, right? My height comes from using a Y value at the left endpoints. So my first rectangle, right, uh, my first rectangle has height f of 1. My next rectangle, right, I now go and look at my next little chopped subinterval right next to the first one, and I say, okay, let's plug in the left endpoint of that interval. And so my next interval my next rectangle will have height f of 2. And then after that, um, right on the third subinterval, I say, OK, I'm going to plug in the left endpoint there and make this rectangle. Um, and so I get f of 3 for that one. And then for the last one, right, I again use a left endpoint. Maybe I'll do red. And I create a rectangle with height at that, at that, um, uh, at that, sorry, at that endpoint. So let me sort of, since I've sort of color coded this, let me sort of say what I'm really, what's really going on. That first purple rectangle, right? That first purple rectangle has height f of 1 equals the height. And how did I know to use that height if they told me to use the left endpoint um, of rectangle 1? And what about the next one, the blue one? Well, here's where the notation comes in. To get the height of that blue rectangle, it's a y value at some point, at this blue point. And where is that blue point? You can compute it, but one thing you know is that you started at 1 and you moved delta x over. Right? This is where it's helpful to think about delta x in terms of your notation. So delta x, we said, was 1 fourth. So this we could write as, that's the point 5 fourths. The left endpoint for that second chopped interval, it has left endpoint x equals 5 fourths. So f of 1 plus delta x, which is f of 5 fourths in this example, this is the height for our second rectangle. And now we can sort of see a pattern in terms of the notation. Right, so for
my orange third rectangle, well, think about it. The left endpoint I plugged in is this orange point all the way over here. And if you really think about that, I started at x equals 1, and I moved two chops over. So that's plus 2 delta x. Now, for this question, that's f of 1 plus a fourth plus a fourth. That's f of 1 plus a half. Um, so that should be f of 3 halves. And this should be the height of our um, third rectangle. Let me close that, sorry. And then our last rectangle, let me zoom out a little bit. Um, our last rectangle, this sort of reddish pinkish one, right, this has height. We plugged in that left endpoint to get this y value for the height. And yeah, the pattern keeps going. This is f of 1 plus, we'll move 3 chops over. So this would be f of 1 plus 3 fourths, um, which looks, what would that be? f of 1 plus 3 fourths, 7 fourths. And this is the height of our third rectangle. Oh, sorry, our fourth rectangle. I said third. And so now here's what we can do. Once we've notated all of this information, we can say, okay, what is the rectangle area we're setting up? Right? So the rectangle area will equal, I'll just say A for area, will equal um, height 1 times width 1 plus height 2 times width 2 plus height 3 times width 3 plus height 4 times width 4. And if you really think about this, right, height 1 we said, oh, that's f of 1. And then what did we say the width of each rectangle was going to be? Each rectangle has the same width, what we call delta x. This makes our process of setting these up a little easier. So now the second rectangle had height f of 5 fourths. And then we have a delta x for that's width. Our third rectangle had height f of 3 halves, and then we multiply by delta x for its width, and then finally our last rectangle had height f of 7 fourths, and that's also times delta x for its width. So we get this sort of long, sprawling formula, but now notice we can compute everything. Delta x, we already know, is 1 fourth. And the function, we were given what function we were told to work with, it was 1 over x. So I can compute each of these heights, right? f of 1 is 1. f of 5 fourths. Well, f of x just flips x into 1 over x, so that's 4 fifths. f of 3 halves, flip it, that's 2 thirds. And then finally, f of 7 fourths is 4 over 7. So when I put all this together, what do I get for the area? Well, for the first rectangle, it should be f of 1, um, which is 1, and then times 1 fourth, and then my next rectangle should be f of 5 fourths, that's highest height, so that should be 4 fifths times 1 fourth, plus 2 thirds for the next one, um, times 1 fourth, and then finally, 
our last one, I believe, was 7 fourths, or sorry, 4 sevenths, times 1 fourth. And so this question was really asking us, chop up the interval 1 to 2 into 4 equal pieces. That's where these, del these uh, delta x's equaling 1 fourth came from. Use the left endpoints to get the heights of each rectangle. That's where these came from. And now add up all the areas of these rectangles. And so here's the formula we get. In this case, it'll be 1 fourth plus 1 fifth plus, this next one I think becomes uh, 1 sixth, and then the last one becomes 1 seventh. So whatever this number works out to be, that is the actual rectangle area um, beneath this 1 over x curve. And I want to repeat what I just said because I used the word actual, but what this actually represents right, is the rectangle area, right? this approximate area. And so what can we say in this case? Let me, um, let me just take out my calculator really quick here while you guys are staring at the screen uh, to get a decimal for 1 fourth plus 1 fifth plus 1 sixth plus 1 seventh. And let's see um, what I get. I get a very strange number. I get 319 divided by 420. Uh, let's see if I can get you a decimal for that. 0.7595. So this is, if I use a decimal here, this area is approximately 0.7595. And so what is this actually saying? This is saying that the actual area from 1 to 2 under the curve 1 over x so again, that funny way of writing that stuff that I just wrote, that is our calculus symbol for saying the actual area. The actual area. Well, I don't know what the actual area is, but it's probably kind of close to this approximate of 0.7595. And let me go back up to the original question just to make a few more points. So. How could we make this area approximation better? We could make it better by using thinner rectangles and more of them. I'm going to junk up this picture up in shaded in blue on the top here. If I had instead chopped this up into these left point intervals, right? So you would see that now I'm using eight rectangles on the same interval. And it would be even closer. And then if I chopped those up, into 16, which I probably won't write all those out, it would be even closer. So what we're actually interested in is this process, not just of doing this once with a set number of rectangles. We're interested in doing this long process, chopping up the interval, setting up rectangle heights, computing the sum of rectangle areas, and then repeating it for higher and higher values of the number n. But okay, that was just sort of a walkthrough example. Um, let's try the same, uh, uh, let's try this example, because here they say, all right, here's a function f of x equals 0 0.5 times x squared. I'm gonna write that a little bit differently. I'm gonna write that as x squared over 2. We can get decimals involved at the end of this. But they tell us the interval, and they say, here's the number of rectangles we want you to use to approximate this area. They even have a nice picture. And they tell us, don't use left endpoints, don't use right endpoints, use something called midpoints. Okay, so how on earth do we use midpoints? Well, in this example, they sort of have a picture here set up already, but let me draw the picture again, starting fresh. 
So we're dealing with the function y equals 1 half x squared. I'm only going to draw half of it because we only care about the interval from 0 up to, say, 3. Okay, so let's start with my picture. We know we're going to use three rectangles to approximate the actual curvy area. So we're going to get kind of a blocky area estimate here. And let's first set this up. Let's say, okay, since we're using n equals 3, we want to do three chops to create sub-intervals. And the width of each sub-interval, I remind you of this formula, it's the length of the interval, so b minus a, divided by the number of chops. So more generally, it's b minus a divided by n. In this case, it's kind of nice when you actually do this for this particular question, we're dividing an interval of length 3 into 3 pieces. So each chop has width 1. Right, so this is nice because um, delta x is just 1. Excuse me. And so I'm going to go to 1 and 2. And those are my intervals. Uh, those are my sub-intervals, I should say. And so now let me just say what we really want to do here, um, some more notation we can involve, is we can say the first um, point of our interval, I could call that x sub 0, that's a, and then the next one would be x1, and that'll be a plus a delta x. So in this case, that's just going to be 1. And then what I might call x sub 2 would be a plus 2 delta x's. That'll just be 2. And then my third point will be a plus 3 delta x's. That'll be 3. So using left endpoints like we did with our previous example, that would be saying, oh, use x0, 0, x1, 1, and x2, 2. Plug those in to get your rectangle heights over each chop. If they said use right endpoints, we would use x1, x2, and x3 and plug those in to get rectangles, uh, rectangle heights. But what they're asking us for is they said use the midpoint. So what point am I going to plug in over this first interval, 0 to 1? They didn't say use the left endpoint 0. They didn't say use the right endpoint 1. They said use the midpoint. So I'm going to go right in the middle of this interval and plug that in to get my first rectangle height. And so the first midpoint, I'll call it M1 for midpoint, midpoint 1, is just going to be, you take the average of those sub-interval points. In this case, you're going to do um, 1 plus 0 divided by 2. The first midpoint is at 1 half. And now what about our second midpoint? Well, again, we can we go to this second interval and we say, okay, how high should I make my rectangle for that part? They don't want me, they didn't say use left endpoints to make the height. They didn't say use right endpoints. They said use the midpoint. So you go in the middle, you've got to figure out that point, and then you're going to plug it into your function to get a rectangle height. So the second midpoint, I think you can see, would be the average of those two subinterval points. And I would just get three halves once I work that out. And then my last interval, oh, maybe let's do that one in green, between two and three. Again, they didn't say use the right endpoint there. They didn't say use the left endpoint. They said use the midpoint. So I got to figure out the midpoint there, plug it into my function to get a rectangle height. And here are the three rectangles this question wants us to use to approximate 
the actual area under this graph, right? And this will be some sort of an approximation. Will it be a good approximation? I mean, that's up to sort of a matter, that's a matter of taste, right? Um, but we can see that these rectangles, for some parts, go over the curve, but for some parts, go under the curve, right? So they're a little bit, a little bit of a mixture of an overestimate and an underestimate. Okay, so they have this talk about upper and lower sums here, but let me finish this example. Um, so that's step one. So let me just record this information so that I can erase it and still have room to write. So our first midpoint is one half. Our second midpoint, which color code it, um, is three halves. And I never wrote down the last midpoint, the one in green. This will be um, three, it will be five halves, three plus two, and then take the average of those two numbers. Okay, so let me erase this step one stuff. So now we have the three rectangles whose areas we want to compute, and so now we just have to compute the um, to actually compute these areas. All right, so what do we need for the area of the rectangle? Well, for any rectangle, we just need its width and its height. Okay, so step two for this question, we would say, all right, what's the height of each rectangle? I have three rectangles. So the width of each rectangle, we already figured out in step one, the width of each rectangle is delta x, which we computed to be one. Now, now we need to figure out the heights. Um, so let's just say, well, height one, what did we agree we were gonna plug into to get our heights? They told us plug in midpoints. So that's gonna be f of m1. Which, in this case, that's going to be our function, one-half times m1 squared. Right, so m1 was also one-half. So that's our first height for our orange rectangle. That's going to be one-half times a fourth. That's one-eighth. Our first height of that orange rectangle is one-eighth. All right. For our second purple rectangle, maybe I'll switch to using purple, the height should be um, the function applied to our second midpoint. So that's one half the value of M2 squared, and M2 we computed, oh, that's three halves. So our second height is going to be nine fourths times one half, that'll be nine eighths. And then finally, our third height is the y value at the third midpoint. So that's gonna be one half, and our third midpoint is five halves. That's all squared. So that's one half times 25 fourths, so that's 25 over eight. Right. Okay. So now we know the heights of each rectangle. We know the width of each rectangle is one. And so now what I can do is add up the area of each rectangle. So let's see if I can clear out enough room to do that here. Okay, so the, now my third step is the areas. The actual rectangle area will equal height one times width one, which is delta x, 
plus height 2 times width 2, which is also delta x, plus height 3 times width 3, which is also delta x. In this problem, all the delta x's are 1. That's how we chopped up this interval. And so we just get height 1, which is 9 eighths, times 1 plus, oops, sorry, I got the wrong one. Height 1 was 1 eighth. I erased that information. Um, 1 eighth times 1 plus 9 eighths for height 2 plus 25 eighths. And if I add all that up, I should get 35 over 8. So that colorful summed rectangle area is the bizarre number 35 over 8. Okay, so let's maybe pause for a minute before getting to upper and lower sums. And um, it's not that upper and lower sums are especially different, they're actually very similar, but let's just summarize what we've done. Okay, so to compute the rectangle area under a curve, we really break it up into a three-step process. Maybe step one, I can't remember if I call this step zero or step one, but I'll call it step one here. Maybe step one is to chop up your interval from A to B into in pieces or what we call subintervals. And each piece has width or length what we call delta x, which is the length of our interval divided by the number n we're using. That's sort of step one. This gives us the width of rectangles. Step two, we now need the height of each rectangle. Right? So step one is all about the width, but step two is all about the height. And to get the height, we need to be told um, we are told which y values of our function of f of x to use. We are told to either use left endpoints, so then our heights would be, okay, that's f of our first endpoint, and then f of our next endpoint, and that would be a delta x over. And then f of our next endpoint, that would be two delta x's over. And then finally, we get f of the sort of second to last endpoint, right? Because these are on the left. We could be using right endpoints. And that would say, okay, let's start at our first right endpoint. That would be one delta x over, and then we go all the way to our last right endpoint. Or as we saw in the previous example, we could use midpoints. And so we would have f of the average between the first two, that's what I called m1, that would be one of our heights, f of the average between the next two, and then finally, the last one would be the average um, between the last two endpoints. So this is all to get rectangle heights. And that information will be given in these problems. They'll say, use left endpoints, use right endpoints, or they might say use midpoints. And something that's coming up next, there are two other ways to get heights. They could say use upper sums, so we'll practice these in a minute, or they could say use lower sums. So these will be down below. But that'll be a slightly different way to get heights. Okay, so step one is basically pay attention to the interval, chop it up into the number they've given us in pieces. This will give you the width of each rectangle. 
Step two is let's create all the heights we're going to need. They're going to tell us how to get the heights by telling us which type of points to plug in to our function. And then step three is to form the actual sum of heights times widths. Now the heights are going to be f of some point you've plugged in, a left point, a right point, a midpoint, something involving upper or lower points, and then the widths are all delta x, and we're going to add these up. So I would really have like f of, here, here's a right one, f of say x1 times a delta x plus f of x2 times a delta x plus, and you could go on and on and on, f of xn times a delta x. Each term in this sum, right, this is a height times a width, a height times a width, a height times a width. And so if n is 4, we'll have 4 terms in the sum, we'll be adding up 4 areas. If n is 10 million, you're using a ton of rectangles, you'll have to crank out all of those heights and attach them to each delta x. So you'll have 10 million terms in this. And the idea is this, this will give us an approximate area. The more terms there are in this sum, the more rectangles we're using and the thinner they have to be. And that means the more terms there are in the sum, the more accurate this is. So let me say, um, this is where our examples have stopped up to this point. But here's the real definition of what we call the definite integral. The definite integral is a sum from A to B of heights times widths. This integral sign is literally built to look like the letter S to stand for sum. And this term right here is supposed to remind you, oh, I'm getting heights by plugging in x values. And this is supposed to remind you, oh, I was getting thinner and thinner widths from these rectangles. And what this is, is a limit. As the number of rectangles you're using gets really, really big of this gigantic sum of f of x1 times delta x plus f of x2 times delta x, right? And so I'm going to write this in awkward summation notation. Here's a capital Greek letter. It really does stand for sum. It's a sigma. And what we're adding up is f of some point we're plugging in times delta x, right? We're adding those up. Maybe we're stopping at n. And here's the thing, delta x, if you really think about it, as I reminded you at the start of this summary, is b minus a over n. Right, so as n gets big, these delta x's, these widths, get small, but we're adding up more and more rectangles. So we're adding up thinner and thinner areas, but we're adding up more and more of them and the hope is, if you could compute this limit, you would get an actual number in the limit, and that would represent the actual area under the curve. So what our examples have done so far is we're, we haven't computed a limit. We've just said, oh, stop this sum at n equals 4 for maybe the first one, and use left endpoints. For the last one, they said, oh, stop the sum at n equals 3 and use midpoints, right? But what we could really do here is say, never stop the sum. And if you could find a way to do that, you would record the actual area, and that's what we call the definite integral. Okay, so let me say a few words um, about uh, upper and lower sums. So, upper and lower sums, um, let me, actually, let me go ahead and make this a new page to talk about upper and lower sums. So, upper sums, <laughs> 
Um, these are saying, okay, we want to approximate the actual area, the definite integral, right? We want to approximate the actual area. I can't spell actual. We want to approximate this with some summation of rectangle stuff, right? So some heights times some widths. And as we saw in our first two examples, if we always use left endpoints, those can be give us rectangles that are too tall sometimes, and sometimes rectangles that are too short. If we always use right endpoints, then our heights might be sometimes too short and sometimes too tall. Same thing for midpoints, right? So for the upper sum, it's the same process, but you just need to change how you do your rectangle heights. Your rectangle heights are the maximum y value. So the maximum value of your function over your sub interval, your chopped piece. So your heights, so your upper sums are always over estimates. Unlike left endpoint, right endpoint, or midpoint heights, these guys, what you're plugging into your function to get these heights depend on the function, right? Your lower sum, if they say, hey, do an approximation of the definite integral using lower sum rectangles, this is saying your heights, you pick the height, which is the smallest y value, over each piece. And this is going to give us an underestimate. Okay, so let's try this with an example below. Let's try this with example two, according to our typed notes. It says, find the upper sum for the function f of x equals 1 minus x squared, and um, the interval is negative 1 to 1. And here they start talking about the partition. So the partition they're using is that's telling you, if they, you ever see the word partition in these examples, that's telling you what the delta x chops are. So let's first deal with the partition, right? So the partition is telling you how to chop the interval. So it says, make a chop at negative one, and then make a chop at negative three-fourths. So that would be here. And then make a chop at negative one-half. Or sorry, then make a chop at one-half, positive one-half. And then make a chop at one. So what's going on with um, this summation technique is we no longer have a common delta x, right? Our partition is telling us how to break up the interval into one, two, three, four. In this case, um, so we have four points, so we get three subintervals. So we're really using n equals three. But because they use the word partition, what they're saying is we're not using a common delta x width. If this question had said, hey, approximate the actual area under 1 minus x squared using left endpoints and three rectangles, we would have chopped this up into rectangles of width b minus a divided by n. So we would have chopped it up into rectangles, each of width two thirds. They didn't tell us to use a common delta x. They said, no, 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 break up the intervals according to what we call this partition, which is just a word for breaking up. So we're not gonna do this in this case. We're gonna use these partitions. So let me zoom in a little bit. Um, so 
What do we need, though, to get this working? We need the widths of our rectangles. Right, so let's, let me make a little line here. So what we need are the widths, and we can actually figure these out. So rather than calling them each delta x, I'll call like width 1. Maybe you could call that delta x1 if you really wanted to. Would be the length of this first subinterval. And so that would be, um, what's the distance between negative 1 and negative 3 fourths? And if you think about that, that has width 1 fourth. Right, that's the width of this little subinterval. But then our second width, maybe if you wanted to, you could call this delta x2, that's the width of this second interval, and it's different. It's a bit longer. Right, it's going to be 1 half minus negative 3 fourths, so that's 5 fourths. Right, this rectangle that we're going to set up for this um, partition has a really wider second rectangle. And then the third width, which again you could call delta x3, the third width would be the length of that last partition subinterval. That's going to be 1 minus a half, that's a 1 half. So that's sort of step one, right? Step one of my process that I outlined above, I use delta x's, but if our delta x's can change, we can just call them widths, and step one was all about widths. Step two is all about building the rectangle heights. And here's where their instruction to use the upper sums comes in, right? So what I'll call height one, is again, since they said they use the upper sum, I look at the maximum y value on the first subinterval. Maybe I'll highlight this in, in green or something. Call this h1 in green. So I go to this first subinterval from negative 1 to negative 3 fourths, and I say, okay, where does the biggest y value occur? And you can look at the function and say, oh, it clearly occurs at 3 fourths. So that tells me that my height for my first rectangle is get the y value that happens at negative 3 fourths. That's going to give me this green rectangle that is going to produce an overestimate of area. Right, and we can even figure this out because they told us the function. The function was one minus x squared. So this will be one minus nine sixteenths. So this should be seven sixteenths. So the height of that green rectangle I just shaded is seven over 16. Okay, now we got to figure out the other two heights. Maybe height two will do an orange. Height two should be the maximum y value on our second interval, our second piece that we've chopped up. And so now I go look at this second piece and I say, okay, what's the maximum y value between negative three fourths and all the way up to one half? Well, if I look at my graph, you can actually use calculus to answer this, right? You can maximize the function here, but it's gonna happen right there at x equals zero, right? I'm gonna get a maximum y value. And so when I, right, I'm gonna get this big overestimating orange rectangle for my second chunk. And so I can actually figure that in, right? What did I figure that height out? What did I plug in to get that height? That was f of zero. And if I plug that into one minus x squared, I get my second height is one. Finally, my third height, right? Height three is going to be the maximum y value over our third interval so over our third piece, 
So for this example, I have visual information, and I can see, oh, the maximum value there occurs right there, right? That's where I'm going to get the maximum y value and create um, create a, a a overestimating rectangle. And I can figure out that y value. That's going to be f of 1 half. And so now I have 1 minus 1 half squared, which is 3 fourths. OK, so what have we really done here? Using upper sums and an unequal partition, right? That was where the word partition came from. We have these different widths. We have width 1 is 1 fourth. And it goes with height 1, which we computed to be 7 sixteenths. So this rectangle here, the area was width 1 times height 1. And this rectangle here was width 2 times height 2. And this last purple rectangle has area width 3 times height 3. So all I'm going to do is sum up all that information. That would be my third step, is to actually form the sum of rectangle area. So my area is going to be height 1, width 1, plus height 2, width 2, plus height 3, width 3. Okay, well height 1 was 7 sixteenths, and width 2 was 1 fourth. Height 2 um, was 1, and the width there was 5 fourths. And then my last one, um, height 3 was 3 fourths, and my width was 1 half. So now, whatever this number turns out to be, that is the area of this upper sum. So that'll be 7 sixteenths times 1 fourth. Um, I can actually, if I really want to compute this, I'll have 7 sixteenths plus 1. Um, I'll factor out everything that has a fourth. Right, and so, oops, um, sorry. Well, let me tell you what. Let me, uh, rather than draw this little calculation out, we will get some number when we crank all that out, some some fraction, and that will be the upper sum area with respect to that partition, um, quote unquote, under that graph. And again, we can all acknowledge these areas don't actually lie under the graph. That's true. But if we were to make more and more of these rectangles, then we would be creating overestimates that get better and better as we increase the number of these rectangles. OK. So let's find, let's do a lower sum example. And I'm scrolling ahead. Um, yeah, so after this example, I'll be able, I'll throw in some popper questions and we'll stop this. But our lower sum example, um, we're going to do it for the function sine of x. And we're going to go along the interval 0 to pi. And they're using this notation p for partition. So if this partition is not evenly spaced, then we're not going to use our formula that the width delta x is b minus a over n. When they say use this partition, they're saying don't necessarily use equally spaced um, widths. Your, your rectangles may be a little wider or shorter than others. And so for this one, we're not going to use this equally spaced one. OK, so let's start carving this up. Um, let's first see, we have four points here for the partition. That's going to create three rectangles. So we start at point 0, and then the next place we stop is pi over 4, and then the next place we stop is 2 pi over 3. So that's going to be right around there, something like that. So our three rectangles, if I want to try and color code them, we might get an orange rectangle here, 
and then maybe a green rectangle here and then maybe a purple rectangle um, over here up to pi I forgot to I forgot to make that point pi and now they're using this notation L sub F this is telling us use lower sums Okay, so that's going to tell us about the heights. So we already kind of have our widths, right? Our first width, maybe W1, is just the width of that first piece or subinterval. And hopefully you guys can see that that's pi over 4. Our second width is just the length of that second piece. That'll be 2 pi over 3 minus pi over 4, right? The difference between those x values. And I could probably put this all over a common denominator of 12, so that'll be 8 pi minus 3 pi. So if I want a single way to write that second width, that'll be 5 pi over 12. And then my last width, the purple one there, is just pi minus 2 pi over 3. And if you work that out, that's just pi divided by 3. So those are my three widths. Now what I need are my three heights. So because I'm told in this problem, again, they told me by using that capital L right here, I'm supposed to use the lower sums, which means on each interval, I'm supposed to use the minimum y value um, as a height. So I go to this first interval, which I've color coded in orange, and say the minimum y value is great there, it's zero. So what I'm going to create on that first interval is a squash rectangle. It's a rectangle of width pi over 4. Oops, wait, wait, wait and height zero. On that second green interval, I'm going to look for the minimum y value over my second interval. Um, and so here it's, again, we could use some calculus to figure this out exactly, but it's going to occur, actually there's two different places where it occurs. Um, we have to check is it occurring at the endpoint pi over 4, or is it lower at 2 pi over 3? Now it looks like the way I've labeled this picture, it's lower at 2 pi over 3, which um, should be correct, but let's just check. This function is, it's going to be the lower of those two numbers. It's either going to be the sine of pi over 4, which is root 2 over 2, or the sine of 2 pi over 3, which now I've got to think about what the sine of 2 pi over 3 is, is that, um, let's see, my picture might be a little bit off. Um, let's see, the sine of 2 pi over 3 is, uh, right, square root of 3 over 2. So, um, Despite my picture looking wrong, I want to make sure I'm right here, um, the smaller value happens at pi over 4. So my, my picture is a little misleading, so I can't stand that it looks like I have a higher value at pi over 4. Um, oh, give me a second. I've got to go do something. Um, sorry, I've got to type this really quick. Right. Um, sorry. Okay. So where were we? Okay. So yeah. So really, let me sort of make this picture look right. Sorry about my my bad trig drawing skills. So there's pi over four, and we'll pretend pi over three gets us up here. So the minimum occurs at pi over four. So the minimum height that we see, the minimum y value, will be square root of two over two. So for this interval, we are going to create this kind of underestimating green rectangle.
And then finally, for our third height, we want the minimum y value um, of our function sine of x on the third piece. And it's not too hard to see that that minimum value is, again, you get the smallest y value there is 0. So you get another squished rectangle. It has no height. So what's our area? Now I can zoom out a little bit. Um, what's our area going to be? So our area is going to be width 1 times height 1 plus width 2 times height 2 and then plus width 3 times height 3. And most of these turn out to be 0. I just have that one in the middle that's not 0. And that's going to be width 2, which was 5 pi over 12, times height 2, which was root 2 over 2. So the area estimate we get for this lower sum, or from this lower sum, is the number 5 pi times the square root of 2, all divided by 24. And I could dump that into a calculator and get a decimal, but that's how much area is in this weird lower sum estimate. Okay, so um, let me now do some popper questions. So popper question three or two, sorry, would be um, if we are not using a partition, capital P, then the width of each rectangle, delta x, always equals the length of your interval divided equally. So the answer choices here are A, true, or B, false. Okay, let's do another popper question, number three. Um, if we are using a partition to, to create rectangle widths, so I'll call the partition P, then the widths of each rectangle are all equal. And we'll get, I'll make this just two choices. Maybe A is the choice true, and B is the choice false. Okay, I owe you two other popper questions. So let's say question four, the answer is C, and question five, the answer is D. Okay, so that concludes um, part one of our definite interval notes. Uh, part two might go a bit quicker. I'll try and sneak in a popper there as well. All right, thanks guys.